Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Please pray with me. May the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, whenever I tell my story, how as early as the age of three, at least part of me knew that I wanted to become a pastor, people invariably ask me, well, then why did it take you so long? Why did you have to do something else first? Well, a big part of that is that, unlike Samuel, I heard no audible voice. I had no dramatic call story. The heavens did not part, and I did not hear harp music. And where I come from, a minister is expected to have a call story. And in fact, the more dramatic, the more like Saul become Paul on the road to Damascus, the better. And so when I started seminary and did not have such a story, I was therefore a bit of a disappointment to many of my more pious neighbors and relatives. But God worked a whole lot more subtly in my life, closing some doors, opening others, and using various people along the way. Probably like many of you, as God calls you to bear this task. Anyway, at a pastor's conference some years ago, our former assistant bishop, Elmer Chilton, told a very similar story as he talked about his own call to ministry. Only being a master storyteller, he decided to make up his own call story. And so instead of the usual, what's perceived as lame uh, story of, well, I always felt like it was what God wanted me to do, he started saying that I was in a tobacco field on a hot, humid summer's day. Steam was coming off the tobacco leaves, and there had been an unexpected thunderstorm in that early afternoon, so I had red mud caked up to my ankles. And so there I was, hot, wet, and muddy. And I looked across the creek, over to the paved road, where I saw a big black Lincoln drive by. The windows rolled up and the air conditioning going full force and the well-dressed man inside was patting the steering wheel as he sang along to whatever song was playing on the radio. And right then and there, I looked up in the sky and said to God, Yes, Lord, I can do that. I will do that. I will become a preacher. Now, Chilton went on to say that he doesn't think that anyone ever believed him, but it did stop them from asking. In our gospel reading today, we have two overlapping call stories. 
First, we read that Jesus found Philip and said, follow me. And then we see that Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found him about whom Moses wrote in the law and also the prophets wrote. Now, occasionally, when you find something, you just stumble upon it by accident. But most of the time, when we use that word found, we use it to indicate locating something that you want after a considerable amount of searching. And that seems to be the case here. That's the sense of the Greek words behind our English translation found, which indicates to us that Jesus was intentionally looking for Philip and that Philip was intentionally looking for Nathaniel and that Philip and the others were intentionally looking for the Messiah. Now, Nathaniel's response to Philip reminds us that this divine human encounter is always a very personal one. We cannot meet God by proxy or by inheritance. As the old saying goes, God has no grandchildren only children. And so Nathaniel will not settle for Philip's experience secondhand. And so he scoffs at Philip's discovery. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What he means is something like this. This man is from the wrong part of the country, the wrong social class. He has the wrong accent. He has no real education or training or official certification. Seriously, why should I listen to him? And you know, many people today question Christianity in much the same way. Can any good come out of the church? It is antiquated. It's behind the times. It speaks the wrong language. It's pre-scientific and irrational. It's judgmental and narrow and full of hate and it's a bunch of hypocrites and etc. etc. and nauseam. And you know, having experienced that, I am certain that Philip was tempted to argue with Nathaniel, was anxious to convince Nathaniel of Jesus' Messiahship. But but notice he resisted this temptation and instead did exactly the right thing. He invited him to come and see. To come and see for himself. Somehow Philip realized that you do not argue someone into a new religious understanding. All you can do, all you can do is help someone encounter this Jesus and then the rest is up to the action of God in his Christ. Here, Nathaniel does come and see. Nathaniel meets Jesus. And Nathaniel is convinced by his encounter that Jesus is the Christ. Indeed, Nathaniel affirms his newfound faith. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Nathaniel was found by Jesus and found both God and his own true self in the process. And all of this, all of this because Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. Now think for a moment about the effect that those words might have on you were you to hear them in some everyday context. Would they generate a certain sense of excitement about whatever it was that you might be invited to witness? Perhaps curiosity? What is this I'm to come and see? Or maybe, maybe gratitude that someone thought enough of you to include you. Come and see. Those words are both simple and warm. Issuing an invitation not only to, to see something, but also to join in a community, to come along and be part of something.
come and see. These words, this invitation, are at the very heart, not simply of this opening scene, but of much of John's account of the Gospel. John's telling of the story of Jesus is structured around various encounters uh, between Jesus and other people. Again and again, from these earliest disciples to a Pharisee named Nicodemus, to a Samaritan woman by a well, to a man born blind, to Peter and to Pontius Pilate, and eventually to Thomas, characters throughout this gospel are encountered by Jesus. Now John structures his telling of the story in this way, in part, to offer us a variety of possibilities, both in terms of the kinds of people to whom Jesus reaches out and the kinds of responses that they offer in turn. And he does this so that we might be led to do the same as we encounter a variety of people to share good news with them and to be prepared for a variety of responses. But not only that, in this variety of people that Jesus encounters, we are also to find ourselves in the story. And indeed, there are times when I'm like Nicodemus, struggling with my questions by night, or like Mary, with the truth, the life, the way, standing before me and not recognizing it, recognizing Him. Or like doubting Thomas. You know, in all these stories, we can find ourselves. And I believe that John intends that. And so across the pages of, of John's account of the Gospel, there are women and men Jews and Gentiles, rich and poor, powerful and vulnerable, people of all shapes and sizes and varieties that Jesus meets. And to each one of them, in one way or another, He says the same thing. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see God doing a new thing. Come and see your future opening before you. Come and see the grace and mercy of God made manifest and accessible and available to all. In response, some take up that invitation and follow, while others are puzzled and confused or simply do not believe Jesus' offer. And some, some not only follow, but invite others to do the same. Come and see. These are such simple, warm, easy, and hospitable words. You see, we are not called to cram our faith down another person's throat or to question their eternal destiny. If you were to die tonight, do you know for certain where you'd spend all of eternity? Or to, or to cast out balls of hellfire. No. But instead, simply offer an invitation to come and see what God is still doing in and through Jesus and the community of His disciples who have chosen to follow Him. Come and see. It really is that simple. But as simple and as non-threatening as these words are, I really wonder how many of us here present have ever uttered them or anything remotely like them to someone we knew. You know, time and time again, studies tell us the same thing. The key factor in influencing persons to attend a church for the first time, is a personal invitation. It's not the size or the reputation of the congregation. It's not the extent of their programming. It's not the beautiful building or the service times or the quality of music or even the style of worship. 
It's not even the brilliant preaching of the minister. Now all those things add value. But the number one reason that people give for coming to a church for the first time is that someone invited them personally. Just as Philip said to Nathaniel that is. Someone said to them, come and see. Which means, folks, that the future of our congregation depends largely on whether or not you will stir up the courage to invite someone to come and see what you have found in this community of faith. Now, of course, this assumes, first of all, that you've actually found something here that is important to you at church. And second, that you're able to name and share that. So seriously, what is your favorite thing about the life that we share together in this place? What is it? And would you be willing to invite someone you know to come and see and share it? Now, only you can answer those questions. I cannot do it for you. But I know for a fact from those uh, notes that you turned in several months ago that many of you here present can name what you found here why church is important to you. So the question remains is simply, will you share it? Now notice, I said that the future of our congregation rests on your ability to invite others to come and see what you have found here. I did not say the future of the church with a capital C. Yes, in a culture that no longer seems to have a vested interest in encouraging its citizens to participate in local congregations as it once did, the future of individual faith communities will, in large part, be determined by their members' willingness to invite others to share what they have experienced. However, however, the future of the church, Catholic and apostolic, is without doubt, in God's trustworthy hands. And God will not leave God's self without a witness. So whether or not you will act, the gospel will move forward. But you will have lost your opportunity. For the same Spirit who descended on Jesus at His baptism is still at work among us. Still capable and, and able and available to make a difference. Indeed, that spirit that inspired Philip and Andrew and who overcame the skepticism of Nathaniel is still offering all kinds of people all over the world an invitation to come and see and creating in them the desire to do exactly that. You know, Dr. Chilton finished his talk at that conference by saying, now folks, I actually do have a call story. We all do. My call story is about being reared by believing parents who took me to church when I was two weeks old and never quit taking me. My call story is about Mrs. Gammons teaching junior high boys Sunday school and putting up with our antics and our misbehavior and somehow leading us to love Jesus and each other. My call story is about going to an evening service at a small rural Presbyterian church and hearing a retired missionary pastor tell stories about God changing lives in Africa and Asia and thinking to myself that maybe, maybe God would change my life also. My call story is about being invited by many different folk to come and see what God in Christ was doing 
is doing, and will continue to do in many different people, places. And I would imagine that for many of us here present today, our call stories are very similar to Dr. Children's. And so let me ask you this morning, what is your call story? How did you sense God calling you, moving you to share His love and mercy and grace with others? And perhaps more importantly, who do you know that needs to know that God is looking for them? Who do you know that needs a little nudge, a little encouragement, who needs to hear you invite them, saying, come and see. Folks, you are Philip. You have met Jesus. So, who is your Nathaniel?